Hey everybody, due to your technical issues, we've lost most of episode 21's audio. We're going to record something soon and have it up by next Monday. In the meantime, here's our discussion about Abyss, the only surviving remnant of the episode. Have a fun listen! A 2 to 4 player games by French designers Bruno Catala and Jacques Chevalier. Of course, we needed someone to speak French to pronounce it properly. Uh, yeah, Bruno Catala, he's a very big name in the French community. And uh, I think there was a time when he uh, appeared on a French TV news. Uh, and uh, in every single French group uh, that I am a part of on Facebook, every two hours, someone was linking the interview again and again and again. I'm fed up with that. But yeah, it, it's a very big name. Uh, it's a game that's starting to have a little bit of a bottle too, because I think it came out in 2014. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big classic. It, it's more than 10 years old. And yeah, it's... Completely considered, considered as a classic. Yeah, it's it's all on that very nice middle ground between a casual family game and something a little bit more than that, um, because it's definitely uh, starting to look at more interesting mechanics and force you to to think force you to to think strategically. But it's not too complicated because. The rules are actually very simple. You only have three moves that you can do during during the play, but uh, everything on the board uh, gives you ways to circumvent the rules. Uh, and the strongest powers have some very uh, built-in uh, mitigation. So how does the game play? Yeah, I'm just checking one thing about Bruno Catala, and I can say at least one other game uh, that is a very, very big one uh, in the board game community, which is Seven Wonders. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we, we're really talking a very, very big name. Uh, so, yeah, Abyss, how does it play? Yeah, sure, I can, I can take care of that. Uh, so, Abyss is a game where you are trying to explore the abyss of the sea to, uh, let's say, do some diplomacy that live there and uh, recruit them and use them then to recruit a sea lord. So during the game, you have three different actions. One is to explore uh, the depths, which will bring you to encounter um, Mirenas. In Moray's, that's the one. Moray's, that's the one. Moray. So yeah, you might encounter moray eels, which can t give you resources, or you can encounter the uh, fish uh, people, the different uh, ocean inhabitants. So you will have uh, different kinds of inhabitants. You will have octopuses, you will have clams, uh, you will have fishes, uh, you will have fishes, uh, star star starfishes, etc. And uh, on each card that you reveal in a succession, you can ask the other players if they want to buy it or pass. If they buy it, they give you a pearl, which is the main resource of the game. And so each player can go on while the price stop exploring and take the last card. You encounter a moray eel and decide to take the resources, or you just have filled uh, the spaces available. I think that's a very interesting mechanics because when you explore, you're not actually in control. The other player can decide to steal things that are interesting to you before you have, before you have an opportunity to take it. So there's always that little push and pull where you know that you might get some pearls, which is a nice resources, but it's not that interesting. And sometimes they can they can steal something from the abyss. So. A big part of the game is try to manage your action well so that other player, ha other player have to go into the abyss and you can buy um, cards from them while during your turns you can do something that will be more directly impactful on your end. Which is, I think, a very good and smart mechanic. Uh, I'll, I'll let you continue, Audrey. <laughs> yeah. After you've done that, all the unclaimed cards will go to a pile. You will do the piles depending on the people and thus on the color of the card. So you will have the, the yellow pile, the blue pile, etc, etc. And there are five colors. And one of the other actions that you can do is take a pile. Just one. 
So at your turn, you can decide to explore, as we said, or take one pile, which is called Ask the Elf of the Council, or you can use your uh, Council card to buy the card of a Sea Lord. The Sea Lords are uh, the main way to score points because they all give you points on their card. You have to use one card of the people that you used to um, buy this lord to put it under the lord and that will score points as well. Each lord has different costs. Some will say, okay, you have to give me eight points of red uh, sea people. Points of red uh, sea people. In that case, you have to use cards with a value of up to eight. Uh, of eight minimum, you can do more, it's okay. Some cards will have, let's say, um, a yellow circle, a white circle, and then the total cost return will be eight. In that two colors of uh, sea people, which will be yellow and another one, and the total value has to be eight. And then after you've bought, you put the uh, lowest value card of your people that you used to buy the sea lord under it. To bring additional points, basically. Um, what what I uh, interesting is that to to, to continue on the, the exploration of the abyss is that at the end of an exploration, the, those piles are going to be pretty full unless the the main player stopped his exploration super early. So once you do once you you do that, it's always more interesting to buy a pile, uh, more resources to buy uh, the logs later. Uh, so again, I think that the, that the game has some very tight and smart uses of uh, resources and actions. Yeah, and one interesting thing is that your hand size isn't limited. So if you end up having, let's say, 10 cards of sea people in your hand, having, let's say, 10 cards of sea people in your hand, that's fine. Well, it, it's fine up until you have uh, someone that takes a lot that limits people's uh, hand size, which uh, happened to me while I had my, my hands completely full with almost uh, 15 cards ready to do a big turn. And then, and then your um, boyfriend just, just took, uh, took that out for me. And yeah, and the different colors of lords uh, give different people uh, different powers. The red uh, lords, for instance, they are the military one, so their powers are all uh, against the other players. They will uh, limit the amount of card cards that they can have in hand. They will limit the amount of points that they can score due to something, uh, etc. The green uh, lords give you generally pearls. The yellow lords generally don't give you any powers, but uh, they give lots of points. The, then there are the blue, which are more manipulation powers, like for instance, uh, you can exchange lords and stuff like that. And the purple ones, they are magical as well, and they can help you exchange cards or get different powers or stuff like that. So generally, it's hard anyway to on one color because uh, there will be other players that will buy the lord that you wanted to get on that color, etc. So it's not really something that you can easily do. Generally, you have to uh, buy different colors of lords. And um, at the at at some point in, and um, at the at at some point in the game, you can end up with keys. The keys can be provided by the resources of the Moray Hills uh, and exploration of the Abyss or on some Lord cards. When you have reached the three arrows point, and, uh, three arrows are spent and you get a location. These locations are the equivalent of the guilds in Seven Wonders. They will give you extra points depending on how many, um, let's say, blue lords you have or how many um, yellow people of the sea you have under your lords, etc. As soon as a lord with a power has been used to get a location, its power is lost because you put the location on the lords that were used to buy it, so you can't use the power anymore. So there is another bit of strategy here that you may not think about uh, at the first time, but if you have a lord that you uh, and you really love its power, you might end up just covering it up the next turn by a location because you buy another lord with a, with a key. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that's what I, w I was going to say is that the the way that the key functions, since you are forced to use them, basically, 
uh, they serve as a limiter onto the limiter onto the strongest powers. Like when you have, for example, an extremely aggressive uh, red power that can really disrupt the game, usually it will have a key on it, maybe two key even, um, so that when you when you play the game, you know that they will only be on, uh, able to use it for a couple of turns unless they starve themselves from buying other lords and from getting locations, which are the best way to get um, uh, victory points at the end. So I, I think that there's a very nice push and pull mechanic there, especially since your third key, if it comes from a lord, you know that quote unquote wasting that lord, you're paying the price just to have it uh, sit under a location, but there are a couple of different ways to get to, to get lord through um, more eels, for example. And there are three special lords which are multicolored. So you to buy them you have to use have to use at least one card of each color and these lords grant you a location right away. So the, the way that they that you can choose the location depends on which uh, multicolor lord uh, we are talking about because one will you will take it from the visible pile of locations, one you will take you will take it from the uh, invisible uh, drawing pile, etc. And these have three uh, keys on their cards, just so that you see it. You know that this card gives three keys, so it's a power to get uh, locations. And I think that's something that's really interesting, because except the power doesn't need text, just the powers have text. So you don't spend many times reading. It very much sits on that same sort of place that Seven Wonders sits, where it's a game that you can pick up when you have a few friends that like board game but are not crazy about it. Like if, if you wouldn't play uh, Eclipse clips with those friends, then it's the perfect game for them. It's worth mentioning that uh, at the beginning, when the game just first came out, uh, there were different uh, and exclusive uh, covers of the box. And there is a second uh, game, which is Abyss Conspiracy, which is a two-player game uh, based on the same game, uh, art. And on this one, there with which is in metal box and very small, you have the same different uh, covers that can be found or very close. And I remember a time when in the market everyone was fighting to get the cover that they wanted, and it, it was fun. I would also say that I would also say that uh, the art of the game is really amazing. Like every sea lord looks great. They all have a very strong personality uh, when you look at them. They usually have a power that will make sense regarding the art. I think that they did a tremendous job with the, the art of the, the lords. Personal final thoughts are, yes, Abyss is a classic. If you are starting a, a board game shelf and you don't and you aren't considering it as one of your first games, then you're bad. That or Seven Wonders, yeah. Or both because Abyss uh, is true to form and Seven Wonders can, can go a bit higher and I think Seven Wonders is more interesting when you are more than four. So that's a very different player count. And it's available on Board Game Arena so if anyone wants to try it, yeah, it's up there. Thank you for the lesson and I hope that you'll end comes out as soon as possible.